Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Samantha and today I'm going to tell you about the history of the Magic 8-Ball. You might be thinking, why would I watch your video when I can just look it up on Google? Well, you can do that if you want. However, after all of the research that I just did, I can tell you right now that you are going to find a lot of misinformation. Plus, reading about the history of things can be boring, so I'm here to make it fun. I do the research so that you don't have to. For those of you who don't know, the Magic 8 Ball is a plastic oversized billiards ball. It's about the size of a grapefruit. It's a novelty toy that is advertised as a fortune telling device. You ask it yes or no questions and you flip it over to reveal your answer. Sounds pretty simple, right? It is. That's all there is to it. But have you ever wondered how it came about, why it's an 8 ball, or when it was invented? Let's dive in. The history of the Magic 8 Ball begins in the 1940s with the son of a medium in Cincinnati, Ohio. Born August 16, 1888, Albert Carter was the son of Laura Pruden, a widely known medium in the spiritualism communities in the 1920s and 1930s. In fact, Sherlock Holmes creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle called her one of the great mediums of the world. He held seances with her during visits in 1922 and 1923. Albert watched his mother perform seances over the years, and he was interested in one of her devices in particular, the Psycho Slate. The Psycho Slate was a spirit writing device using a slate and a slate pencil to communicate with those who had passed on. Arthur Conan Doyle described her slate writing performance in his travelogue, Our American Adventure. And Herod Carrington, an investigator of psychic phenomena, also included an account of his experience with Laura Pruden in his book, The Story of Psychic Science. It took me so many takes. I'm not going to make it this whole long thing, but both accounts explained how the session went. They both stated that the slates did reveal the answer to their question and that there was no way that she could have tampered with it. Arthur Conan Doyle and his wife believed the results to be authentic, as did many others, but of course there were always skeptics. None other than Harry Houdini, who was notorious for debunking mediums, referenced Laura Pruden in a letter from 1925 talking about challenging her. I don't know what came of that, but he's famous and he talked about her, so I wanted to include it. Laura Pruden died in 1939 at the age of 86. I just figured I'd throw that in there because I didn't want her to feel like a loose end. Because she just leaves the story because she died before everything happened. So, as I was saying, her son Albert was very interested in her spirit communication device and it gave him an idea. A portable fortune telling device that any spiritual seeker could use at any time. It would require no skill to use so that anybody could operate it. It took some time for Albert to work out the details, it had to look mysterious, it had to offer a variety of answers, and it had to be cheap because he didn't have a lot to work with. Messing around with murky liquids in cans and bottles, Albert created the Psycho Seer, a 7-inch tube divided in half with a viewing window on each end. Each half contained a six-sided dye floating in a dark, viscous liquid. Most sources say it was molasses from his mother's kitchen. I don't know. Each side of the dye was inscribed with a different answer to a yes or no question. When the tube was turned end up, the dye would float to the surface, revealing your answer. This thing seems very rare because I could barely find any pictures of it on the internet. And trust me, I tried very hard. Albert was confident in his invention and he decided to show his prototype to local merchants. A man named Max Levinson expressed interest immediately. He quickly proposed working together to mass produce the Psycho Seer. To accomplish this, Max Levinson contacted his brother-in-law, Abe Bookman, who was a graduate of the Ohio Mechanics Institute. I couldn't find any pictures of anybody except Abe Bookman and that really scary picture of Albert Carter's mom. Sorry, Laura. Albert filed a patent for his invention on September 23rd, 1944. The patent states, hold on, let me read it because there's no way I'm remembering this. The present invention relates to an amusement device and is particularly directed to a device which presents unpredictable, discriminating marks of informative value for use in carrying out the steps in various games or the like. I got that in one try. I didn't even stumble my words. In 1946, Albert and Abe combined their first names and formed Al Abe Crafts to produce and market their product. They advertised it as the Psycho Seer, the Miracle Home Fortune Teller. It didn't do as well as they had hoped. Likely story, right? On November 2nd, 1948, the patent that was filed in 1944 was finally granted. Unfortunately for Albert, he passed away at the age of 59, just a few months before the patent was granted. Albert had assigned half of the rights to Abe Bookman, one-fourth of the rights to Max Levinson, and one-fourth to Julius Mintz. I don't know who that is, but facts are facts. 
A lot of sources say that Albert lived a troubled life due to alcoholism and that he died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. Abe Bookman said that Albert was broke and stayed in flop houses, but gave these kind words. While he was sober, he was a genius. Nevertheless, Al Abe Crafts carried on. Despite customers' attraction, the psycho seer wasn't generating sales and Abe believed that it was due to the price. He began making changes to improve the device and reduce manufacturing costs. First, he cut the design in half, eliminating the double chamber, leaving it with one viewing window and one die. The die went from having six sides to 20 sides, and Abe hired a psychology professor to come up with 20 different answers for each side. Of the 20 answers, 10 are positive, 5 are neutral, and 5 are negative. Along with changing the design, Abe also changed the name to Psycho Slate, the pocket fortune teller. I don't know if the term gypsy is offensive, I don't use it often, but all of the sources said gypsy, so... Abe added a gypsy fortune teller to the label and the 12 zodiac signs, which do seem to appear on the original Psycho Seer. Um, but yeah, this is the smaller version. I obtained it from eBay. It has the one viewing window and it's actually just a jar. Like this is a jar, a glass jar. Yeah. Psycho Slate, the pocket fortune teller. Al Abe Crafts. In order to generate interest, Abe hired models to dress as gypsies and demonstrate how to use the product. The instructions are on the top, but I guess he wanted to be flashy. It says, place left hand on this end. Ask a yes or no question about the future. Wait 10 seconds and turn Psycho Slate over. Answer will appear on Spirit Slate in the window. This one, I actually can see the answers. Um, some of them you cannot. Let me ask it a question. Wait. Why left hand? Place left hand on this end. Okay, sure. Hmm. Is anyone going to watch this video? Ten seconds is a long time. <laughs> Most likely. I'll take it. Better than a no. But anyway, even with all of this that he was doing, the Psycho Slate still wasn't doing very well. In late 1948, Abe opted for another redesign. He began encasing the tubes in a spherical design to resemble a crystal ball. He then advertised it as a crystal ball fortune teller. Another eBay find. Yeah. You know, it says as seen on TV, but I could not find a single commercial for this thing. The instructions say, hold ball with black window down. Ask a yes or no question about the future bowling or anything else <laughs> wait 10 seconds turn ball over with black window up in level position written answer will appear on spirit slate and window bowling or anything else that is so random so this says it was manufactured exclusively for dixie sales and marketing by al abe crafts this is all i could find anyway so this is the crystal ball if you're asking me that's my answer. So, to my knowledge, this was the first version of the Magic 8 Ball turning into a ball, I guess. It's red. Of course, there's going to be a big glare, but it's not big. <laughs> uh, it has the crystal ball fortune teller thing written on it. And as you can see, it is not actually perfectly round. But yeah, it has the jar on the bottom, just like the other one. Literally just put the jar in there. This one, I don't think I can see the answers in this one. Yeah, this one you can't read, but I still wanted to have it. That's that. You'd think it would work out, right? It's a crystal ball. Fortune telling, crystal ball. Well, guess what? Outlook, not so good. Although this new design was yet again unsuccessful and sales were not improved, the new round shape did catch the attention of Chicago's Brunswick Billiards Company. In 1950, Brunswick Billiards were seeking a unique promotional item for their company. Al Abe's crystal ball fortune teller piqued their interest. Brunswick Billiards reached out to Al Abe Crafts to commission a version of their fortune teller in the form of a traditional black and white eight ball. The promotional eight balls were extremely popular. Once the promotion ended and the contract with Brunswick Billiards was up, Abe continued producing the design as an eight ball and then began selling it to the general public under the name Magic Eight Ball. At first, the Magic Eight Ball was sold as a fortune teller slash paperweight. After noticing its popularity amongst children, Abe decided to remarket the Magic Eight Ball as a toy and that's when sales really took off. 
Got this one on eBay too. I don't think you can read the answers on this one either. Ugh. Nope. Good stuff. So while Albert Carter did not invent the Magic 8 Ball as we see it today, he did invent its predecessor and its functionality. And that's the story of how the Magic 8 Ball came to be a thing. Oddly enough, Al Abe Crafts was not the first to use an 8-ball for magical purposes. In 1940, 10 years prior to the Magic 8-Ball's debut, the Three Stooges short called You Nasty Spy features an oversized 8-ball that was used for fortune-telling. I feel like that's pretty wild. Like, that's a very crazy coincidence. I feel like it's so random to associate a billiards ball with a crystal ball and two people did it. So I couldn't find a whole lot after the 1950s. All I could really find was that in the 1960s, Abe Bookman filed his last two patents, one of which was filed January 2nd, 1962. So I'm gonna have to read the title for this one. Liquid filled dye agitator containing a dye having raised indicia on the facets thereof. Lengthy, I know. Basically what that means is that the dye would now have raised letters like we see it today. This change was supposed to allow for only the letters to be seen as the face of the dye was no longer pressing up against the viewing window. In 1971, Abe Bookman sold Allied Crafts to Ideal Toys Company, but stayed on as a consultant. Did you know that you're not actually supposed to shake the Magic 8 Ball? It creates bubbles and it could obstruct the answers. Ideal Toys fixed this problem and filed a patent for a bubble trap in 1975 called Bubble Free Dye Agitator. It looked like an inverted funnel at the bottom of the tube. The air was directed into a chamber where it was unable to escape and that patent was granted in 1977. Fast forward a few years, the company started changing hands. In 1982, CBS Toys purchased Ideal Toys, then merged with Viewmaster International, forming Viewmaster Ideal Group. Tyco Toys purchased VMIG in 1989, and then finally, Mattel acquired Tyco in 1997. The Magic 8-Ball has been sold and manufactured by Mattel ever since. Abe Bookman passed away at the age of 95 on August 28, 1993, but his Magic 8-Ball is still a hit. Today, about 1 million units are sold each year. In 2011, Time Magazine named it one of the all-time 100 greatest toys, and in 2018, the Magic 8-Ball was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame. The Magic 8-Ball has been produced in many different forms and designs over the years, but I would say that nothing beats the classic. All right, that's all I've got. If you made it this far, thank you for sticking around. I really like the history of the Magic 8-Ball, and my mom loves the Magic 8-Ball, so I was really excited to make this video. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to comment some suggestions of things that you would like to know the history of. I'm really looking forward to making more videos like this, so go ahead and let me know. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. You can check out my social media. I put the links in the description below. And that's all I've got. So thank you again and bye. Shit, I forgot to include the little one. Where's the little answer? Heh, <laughs> most likely. Isn't that what the other one said? Most likely. Okay, that's proof right here. I will be successful.